Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Public Media. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Welcome to Your Legislators. I'm Anthony Moreno. Our guest on the program is District 34 Republican State Senator Ron Griggs. Senator Griggs serves on the Senate Conservation and Judiciary Committees. He joins us now from the Roundhouse Studios in Santa Fe to talk about issues he is working on during this legislative session. And a note to our viewers, we are taping this program on Wednesday, a day before the session is scheduled to end. Senator Griggs, thank you so much for joining us on Your Legislators. Thank you and good morning. It's great to have you on the program now. I want to start off and talk about something that obviously gained a lot of attention during this 30-day legislative session, and that was the passage of the red flag uh, firearm, uh, extreme firearm protection law, the red flag law that was really crafted in uh, your committee there. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that piece of legislation. Well, let's just let's just get right to the meat of things. But uh, <laughs> no, Anthony, I need to, I need to give you a disclaimer. Uh, when I first got up there this year, somehow I managed to uh, to hook up with some allergies, and I have been uh, a little bit messed up all session as far as that goes. I'm a little swollen, a little puffy, so this is not exactly my normal look. But uh, you know, it's the best I could do. <laughs> Um, but the, the red flag law, you know, it's one of those things that I think, um, I think is certainly well-intentioned from a lot of people, but as a, as a practical matter, you know, there's already laws on the books that can help uh, uh, sheriff's departments and local police officers and others get a hold of those guys that they're concerned about. So it's, uh, this one's going to be a little tougher to deal with. Uh, there's too much time in between some things. So if somebody's, uh, somebody's creating a disturbance, domestic disturbances, uh, the time in between when uh, the, uh, the officer finds out and the uh, uh, complaint is then taken to the judge and it's acted on I mean that's the sort of stuff that may just you know take it to uh, uh, to a timeline that's not going to be a good thing yeah so, so did you do, I just want to interrupt you I'm sorry uh, did you support this legislation I did not okay now you it seems like you had some <clears> concerns <throat> in regards to uh, the due process end of things with this legislation you know, the, the due process is, is certainly one, but, you know, just it's just the, the practical nature of the issue. And then, you know, because you can separate these things, I suppose, into two types of events <clears throat> that Red Flag is trying to deal with. One of them is, uh, <clears throat> so here's these allergies kicking in. One of them is, um, uh, you know, those events where a guy really, really plans it out, you know, and he's going to uh, go to the schools or he's going to go to the mall and he's going to do something. Or the guys that are acting erratically in a domestic violence uh, uh, situation. And... I don't, I don't see actually in either how it's liable to do what everybody hopes it does. You know, you, <clears throat> you hope you're wrong, and I tell you that right now, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope it does have, you know, a positive effect on something, because if you can, if you can save a life, that's important. But... Um, well, I just want to kind of go. interrupt you there again. I'm sorry, but I, I, 
I'm trying to figure this out. I mean, there's been 17 states in the District of Columbia have enacted these laws. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a poll by the Global Strategy Group, KRWG reported on this recently, that late last year on behalf of every town, uh, gun safety, the poll found that 85% of the people surveyed supported these laws, including 78% of gun owners. Um, do, I, I'm kind of concerned is if, if we don't take a step with this legislation to address this issue, mm -hmm. I mean, what are your thoughts on how we solve this issue in regards to gun violence in New Mexico? Obviously, it is an issue in parts of the state and across the country. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I wish we would talk about those sort of solutions more because what we usually get our <clears throat> what we usually get our arms around, Anthony, is we want to talk about the, the symptom and addressing the symptom, and we don't want to talk about solutions. We don't want to talk about behavioral health and what we did 30 or 40 years ago with people that uh, started allowing uh, more people with mental health issues to be integrated among the population. And so those challenges, along with, along frankly, with just the growth in population. Well, the I mean, our, our, growth have, in population in New, our, our growth in population in New Mexico hasn't exactly been soaring. In fact, there's been a lot of folks concerned about people leaving the state. Uh, now, you mentioned mm -hmm. behavioral health and more people being out on the streets. I mean, in 2013, we had that Medicaid freeze that was enacted and called for by former Republican Governor Susana Martinez. Now, many in the behavioral health community said that was like a bombshell going off in our behavioral health system. Obviously, folks are really mm -hmm. concerned in our state in many ways, according to advocates uh, in behavioral health, the state is still trying to get back on its feet in providing behavioral health care. And I've been involved in several reported projects with this uh, here in Southern New Mexico. There are some major challenges with behavioral health. So how do you feel that the state uh, can really address this issue? Now, I wanna go back to 2013 because that Medicaid freeze obviously uh, caused some behavioral health providers in the state to close. Now, the taxpayers of New Mexico recently have had to pay some of those providers $10 million a piece be, uh, in regards to uh, due to lawsuits that those providers filed in the state. Now, we should let our viewers know, of course, they probably already know that the Attorney General's office uh, found that those behavioral health providers, there were no instances of fraud, which the former governor claimed. So I, I'm kind of concerned uh, with this issue and you as a, as a state lawmaker, and calling up this behavioral health issue and somebody who is running for re-election in your district in Alamogordo in southern New Mexico, a part that has many challenges. I mean, how do we move forward with this behavioral health issue? Uh, obviously, we have a time where there is little excess revenue. So tell me how you as a state lawmaker plan to address this issue. Well, you know, how many... Um I don't know, we go back and we, you know, we can argue about whether the governor should have and shouldn't have. Uh, at the same time, when this was going on, uh, she was joined by a Democrat attorney general in how they, uh, how they decided to address the problem from the uh, legal concerns through the contracts. Now, obviously, obviously, as they dealt with it, uh, it didn't turn out, I'm sure, the way they would have hoped either. But, uh, you know, it did. It did create a different set of issues because all of a sudden these people didn't have a way to get with folks and talk and maybe work through some of the, the issues they have. So the challenge <clears throat> that it brings up is just like you talk about. We got to figure out again ways to to get our arms around the issue not only not only that was created by that but the issue that existed <clears throat> during that time so the the um, um, uh, the behavioral health issue although it has expanded hasn't been dealt with 
in New Mexico in a way that's going to make you, me, or any others feel safer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so that's, we, that's, that's completely understandable. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, as somebody who, who sees the impact of this every day through reporting and just being somebody who walks around and travels around my community, there is an obvious impact there. Um, so what do you know? I mean, what are you looking at? What is the research showing on steps that states are really addressing that, that issue of behavioral health that we're seeing some success? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure we are. Uh, and, um, and Anthony, you know, we have focused <clears throat> with the, uh, you know, the budgets and the, and the growth in revenues. We focused on schools a lot. You know, over, uh, oh man, we put over 600, uh, 600 million more, I believe it was, last year, and we're putting more in this year, uh, you know, to help, uh, help students move their lives forward, learn better, grow. We've created the early childhood departments to, to try to help kids be, uh, you know, come in, <clears throat> have uh, have meals, have uh, the opportunity to learn and, and do better early so they do better late. We're doing those things, which arguably should have done, we should have done earlier, but we still have this back-end problem with the folks that are in the system or on the fringes of the system that we just have don't have our arms around. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm hopeful that maybe in the next session, there will be more, more bills come up with uh, behavioral health with uh, legislators that actually are more familiar with the ins and outs of the system than I am. Now, you, you brought up uh, education and the massive investment. Uh, obviously, everybody knows that the governor called for a moonshot in education and uh, this past week, this week, signed uh, into law enacting the Early Childhood um, Education and Care Fund uh, that is going to be relying on excess revenue from oil and gas in our state. Your thoughts on uh, this action and the creation of that fund? Well, you know, it's like, it's like anything else. When you have something that's uh, totally new um, and is being uh, dealt with in a new way, you hope it works. You know, we don't, we don't have a way to know for sure, uh, but we hope it works because all of these things, Anthony, are, are designed to make New Mexico better. Everyone introduces things and does this stuff that they believe will work better for New Mexico. And, you know, I hope it does. I hope all this early childhood focus really brings the benefits that, uh, you know, some are just passionate about. So it's, uh, you know, well, it's something I that I hope works. It's something that the state really doesn't have a choice in the matter either, because as we all may know here, it's uh, facing a lawsuit in regards to not providing adequate care uh, to students, at-risk students in our state. Uh, I want to move on and talk about some legislation that you've been involved with. I want to talk with you about SB uh, 279, the Food Grocery Receipts Tax Act. Can you tell me about that legislation uh -huh. and uh, why you felt out the need for that? Okay, Anthony, I was mayor of Alamogordo. You, you may or may not remember. Yeah. But uh, back in 1994, uh, they removed the tax from food. Uh, but when they did that, uh, they gave the uh, uh, communities what you call a hold harmless payment. And so the communities have been getting a payment that's coming straight out of the state's back pocket from you and me and everybody else. So that money is just coming straight from the general fund, going to cities and counties and the state, or it's not being offset any any way, shape, or form. So you've got uh, this payment that's going to uh, 
uh, cities and counties that's reached as high as $150 million a year. Well, in 19, or excuse me, in 2013, the legislature decided that they would uh, stop making the hold harmless payments because we couldn't afford to at that time. And many we communities, I think many people in our communities here in southern New Mexico know exactly what happened there. Uh, when that money stopped coming in, uh, communities, cities, counties were forced to kind of figure out how they're going to make that that revenue uh, and so they raise taxes um, so is that kind of your your feeling behind be uh, behind this uh, act are you trying to get some extra revenue in places that don't have major uh, shopping centers and things like that well un understand that what it what it did when you uh, when you stop making those payments we gave communities three one-eighth increments of what was called the hold harmless tax it was designed to be imposed incrementally as communities lost that revenue. Well, communities like Las Cruces, I believe Doniana County, I believe Otero County, decided they would go ahead and impose the entire 3 H right away. They double dipped basically on, that, on the tax and the payment. So they were getting them both. Now Las Cruces, what you're gonna see is Las Cruces already implemented it, so as they go down with the whole harmless payments, they're gonna have to figure out something else. I don't know what that'll be, because they've already imposed the whole harmless tax. But the, uh, uh, the thing that this other bill does, which is designed to um, uh, you know, stop the state's payments and put then cities and counties on a little more stable source is you turn around, you stop the hold harmless payments now, just stop them because for the most part, most of these communities have either imposed the 3H or almost imposed all of it. Uh, so let's just do that. Let's then put a two and a half percent tax on food. That can go to cities solely and keep cities whole from the loss of the hold harmless payments, counties, because of the way it was all structured, when they impose that three H, they actually gain revenue, then uh, get more revenue from the uh, hold harmless tax than they were getting from the hold harmless payments. Then, as the other parts of that bill, the two other parts of the bill was you stop taxing Social Security or you stop uh, your income tax on Social Security yeah. and you stop your income tax on military retirement. You create a better, more sound tax system and uh, hopefully, hopefully the uh, uh, doggone cities and counties won't have to raise more because over the next little bit, they will have more people uh, either stay especially in Las Cruces and Alamogordo, where there's a lot of potential military retirees, a lot of people coming to Las Cruces that could be social security retirees. So we, we sit there and put us on, a, on an upward path instead of a downward path. Yeah, I know some lawmakers, especially those in rural communities, have been really supportive of uh, this issue and that tax, but there are those in the state that are very concerned living in one of the poorest states in the country that this could impact the most vulnerable who are struggling and living dollar by dollar, week by week. And so this can make an impact on taking food off their table. Your thoughts on that issue? Well, you know, Anthony, do the numbers. And uh, then also look at the um, uh, the fact that how many of the, the most vulnerable that you talk about, the poorest of the poor, who do not pay tax on, uh, on food already, uh, who will not be impacted by, uh, by that. So, uh, you know, those sort of things become um, the debates we need to have because we need to put the state on good solid footing going forward instead of trying to bounce from election to election, uh, hoping that 
we can sneak something in somewhere that really, uh, uh, you know, changes the system maybe, but doesn't really address the fact that the system needs to have some reformation. So it puts the state on a, uh, uh, a more solid footing to grow uh, and prosper. Yeah, you, you talk about systematic change. Uh, one of the legislation pieces that you've been involved with was uh, increasing the in-state per diem rate. Uh, your thoughts on why you feel that is needed? You know, I, um, that hadn't been, you know, hadn't been changed in a long time. I, I signed on with my uh, friend, Senator Pat Woods, mm -hmm. up there to, uh, to allow for uh, local communities to pay up to a high, well, can pay a higher rate when they send their employees out to uh, uh, remote parts of the state or other parts of the state. I think the uh, the per diem rate this time is like about ninety dollars a day. So if you send a guy from uh, uh, Las Cruces and you send him to Taos in the height of the uh, 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 tourist season. You know, he may he may have to live in one of the more um, uh, uncomfortable hotels he might see up in Taos, or yeah. he's going to pay more than he would, or going to pay more than his per diem allows. So it's just an adjustment factor to try to make it more fair to uh, to local uh, guys, state guys, to. Uh, uh, if we're going to send them around so they at least don't have to come out of their own pocket. It is a big state. Now, I, I want to talk with you about something else that has gained uh, more traction this legislative session. Speaking of systematic change, and that is the issue of paying state lawmakers in New Mexico. Many may not know the, that in our audience that New Mexico does not pay its state legislators. Uh, they do get a per diem, your thoughts on paying state lawmakers in New Mexico, would you support that? Well, you know, I think we passed a bill out of judiciary, uh, actually it's a constitutional amendment, I think, which would allow the state ethics uh, commission to set salaries. And it'd be something you'd have to vote on and, and go from there. Uh, Do you support it though? You know, I did then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But that's, uh, you know, I should get it out committee. Let's talk about it a little more and see what's what. The good, good chance it never gets to the floor. Mm. Good chance. Really? And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, those sort of things, I mean, they're good ideas. Uh, should lawmakers get paid? Well, you, you think about your own situation. Think about, you know, your next door neighbor. Maybe you've got somebody that's really capable and who might run for office if he felt like he could, uh, you know, pay the bills if he did. Doesn't have to get rich, but just pay the bills. Yeah. Uh, per diem doesn't pay the bills. That is correct. Many have been critical uh, saying that it only leaves uh, people that can afford to take 30 or 60 days off or are retired uh, to run for office in New Mexico. Um, so it's obviously an issue uh, we are looking forward to keeping an eye on as that continues. Uh, I only have about Good. three minutes left, but I want to talk with you about something you did bring up, and that was the state tax on Social Security in New Mexico. Okay. Uh, your feelings on this issue being tabled? Well, here's what it'll do, I think. You know, you've got surrounding states that don't tax Social Security. Uh, you provide, if, and if you provide it, and retirees are becoming more discriminate on where they go, and they look at that, and that's one of those boxes that they check, and they say that, you know what, New Mexico taxes Social Security. Let's look at, uh, let's look at Colorado, Texas, and, and Arizona. Oh, man, they don't tax that, so that's a big positive for us, so let's consider them first and if you get cut out of that picture right away good chance they they never consider you again regardless of this of the argument that's out there that you shouldn't tax social security from the you know beginning anyway because it's being taxed twice uh, so from 
one perspective, uh, it's not a good idea, well, or no, 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 it's a good idea from this perspective, it's a good idea from this other perspective, it creates a hole in the budget. Yeah. So how do you backfill the hole? So, I mean, I want to kind of hear where you stand on the issue, though. I mean, you do you support no, I, a I, repeal? I, I support it. Yeah, the, uh, the Republican Senate mm -hmm. sent a letter to the governor asking her to uh, uh, re reconsider her stance and try to get one of these bills passed this year. Yeah, I thought I saw your name and your signature on that uh, piece of paper. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. we are out of time here on your legislator. Senator Griggs, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us, and we hope you feel better. Well, I appreciate that last part for sure, and it was a pleasure talking to you, Anthony. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you, Senator Griggs. Good luck with the uh, rest of the session as we tape this. And we want to thank you for joining us for your legislators. Don't forget, you can always send us your feedback. Email us at feedback at nmsu.edu. We're always looking forward to hearing your ideas for this program and others. We're on social media. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and you can always subscribe to the KRWG News YouTube channel. I'm Anthony Moreno. We'll see you next time.